is that time again, finally. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming, so I apologize that this is up so late, but this is officially the first uh, Rex Rambles video, which is kind of the revamping of my Q&A series, call it what you will. Um, I apologize for the digital background of my virtual hangar with some plane models that you'll hopefully see behind me as I'm having to fall back on using Zoom for the recording of this for reasons that I will get into later on. Um, but firstly, I want to continue with tradition and open up this particular video by quickly answering some questions asked over by the good supporters over on Patreon. So. Let's get stuck into that, and then we will cover the other topics of discussion and some other things I want to talk about, plus some channel updates. So please stick around for that or skip through if you don't want to do the Q&A, but these are some interesting questions. So let us quickly scroll through because I've got everything actually saved on a Word document for a change so that I don't constantly stumble and um and ah my way through the whole thing. So questions from the patrons. On what page are we up to? Ah, this one. Okay. Uh, so the first one is asked by Robert Ilston. Um, I believe that's how your surname is pronounced. I apologize if it's not. Beyond institutional knowledge or institutional inertia, what other reasons were there for an airplane for airplane manufacturers to resist changing from all wood to all metal frames and fuselages? Now, a couple of things can affect this and on the whole, most ended up making this transition and it and the transition happened fairly naturally. In the 1920s, moving to the 1930s, as things advanced, metal became far more affordable, uh, stronger and safer than wood. And the the practices of metallurgy and actually making things for aircraft developed quite quickly. Obviously, um, metallurgy for aircraft is, is vastly different than, say, um, building metal warships, for example. You, you're doing it on a whole different um, scale. Like, well, not scale, but yeah, scale, I guess, because, you know, you're not making inch thick metal plating. You're, you're making something as light as possible, but also as strong as possible. Um, interesting point most of the um sort of pioneering work done in the field of uh, making alloys used in the avi aviation industry came from the development of uh, airships specifically zeppelins um that that is a topic i will touch on in the eventual sequel to the balloon video where i start covering the history of zeppelins but for reasons i wish not to divulge from the case of spoilers um that project has been temporarily postponed just whilst i gather some hopefully fairly exclusive data and information so stay tuned for that but yeah on the whole it was mostly natural i, I digress um uh, now a lot of this did also depend on the individual company um now just sticking just to keep the example simple i'll stick with the british aviation industry and compare say let's have a look at um actually here's a good example de havilland versus armstrong whitworth and you've got the opposite ends of a spectrum. De Havilland stuck with wood probably for the longest out of most uh, manufacturers. And a lot of that was down to institutional stubborn, I guess, um, with, with the way Jeffrey de Havilland worked. Um, I mean, there were huge advantages to using wood in certain airframes. And as de Havilland built a lot of light aircraft, um, a lot of light personal aircraft as well, wood still made sense for a lot of things. And for certain far flung areas where aircraft would be operated, wood was beneficial still because um, if you're if you're landing an aircraft on small remote airstrips, obviously a, a lighter wooden airframe will be able to manage that a lot better. The, 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 the trade off is that a lighter wooden airframe is obviously more susceptible to being damaged on landing on a rough airstrip because it's a rough airstrip. Surprise, surprise. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I said Armstrong Whitworth, didn't I? I didn't mean Armstrong Whitworth. I meant Bolton Paul. Silly me. On the other end of the spectrum, you have Bolton Paul, which were one of the sort of pioneers in the British aviation industry for using metal framework and then all metal aircraft as well. Um, they their civil designs, their bomber designs. Um, I, I think 
they're one of the exceptions in the aviation industry in, in Britain, possibly because they came along a little bit after some others, was that most of their designs were metal. Like, it, um, I've actually got a book in the bookshelf over there on Armstrong with, with aircraft, but like the book's about that thick. And I would say the amount of it that is all metal aircraft or at least metal framed aircraft is about that much of it. So the majority, um, obviously the, the metal frame has its advantages over wood strength, obviously drawbacks can be weight, but they can also make weight savings. Cause obviously you can use hollow metal tubing as opposed to solid, uh, wooden, not planking, but like frames, girders, spars, that sort of thing. Um, the the biggest thing that and in hindsight this makes sense one of the biggest things that influenced where an aircraft manufacturer made the switch was ultimately cost um it wasn't safety which is what it would be nowadays i mean back then aviation safety literally was a guideline rather than a rule because they were still figuring things out in terms of aviation safety um it was mostly from a cost standpoint sometimes a material shortage standpoint or a material surplus standpoint as well but you got to remember like when these um a lot of these sort of transitionary aircraft were being developed it was post-world war one in the 1920s going to the early 1930s the global economy if you could call it that back then was not in a particularly fun place. I mean, even before, um, even before Wall Street crash brought on the Great Depression, yeah, you know, some countries were doing really well, America was booming, but other nations were still in not ideal financial circumstances because the effects of the Great War, France and Britain, particularly Germany, obviously, but they were also being uh, restricted by Versailles, though very earlier on, they were finding very good ways of circumventing that. So money was the biggest influencer as opposed to institutional knowledge or institutional inertia. Hopefully that answers your question. I know that was a very long and rambling answer, but I'm, I'm trying to do these um, on the cusp now without actually scripting my answers before. My previous Q&As, I actually did a lot of this scripted just because I'm, I'm not very comfortable with um, speaking on the cusp, but I'm trying to improve that. So going through these Rex rambles videos, you're, you're going to witness me going from a stuttering mess to hopefully somebody that can vaguely do public speaking in the future. Cause I'm not very good at it. So this is good practice for me. And it also means I get to answer your questions. So it's, it's a win-win. Um, Caleb asks, will there be a video on flying wings? Absolutely. Um, lots of stuff on flying wings are planned. Um, obviously you've got the whole line that were, um, pioneered by Northrop. There were experimental flying wing designs developed by other major aviation developers, um, some minor aviation developers that not many people know about. And um, it's not just powered fl flying wings. There are a lot of, um, uh, if not flying wings, but very close to sort of blended body gliders, um, a couple of which were actually used. Um, I believe Germany had the Gotha. I forget what the exact model was, but that was essentially a flying wing glider. It wasn't a true flying wing, but it was very close uh, but yeah there are definitely going to be a a long video on the development of flying wings um in general but i'm also working on one which takes us through the development of the flying wings that led specifically to the b2 um because that's got an amazing history of development from different aircraft types going all the way back to you know the, the second world war and even before so that that is a long-term video project that i'm working on among a hundred others, basically, but a video on flying wings um, is coming. In, in fact, if you bear with me for 30 seconds, I'll just disappear out of shot Not at the moment. Uh, that, that, that's going to be another point I talk about later on. Um, the, this book isn't currently one of the ones that is, is, isn't, it, it's in the box, one of the many boxes. Um, I have a storage problem, uh, which, which is, which is becoming a serious issue. <laughs> Um, Fraser asks, are you planning to do a video on the DH Hornet? Yes. Um, Hornet's definitely on the list. Um, a lot of de Havilland's are on the list, but, but the Hornet and other aircraft of its class are, are definitely coming. Um, when it comes to when I'm going to be covering specific aircrafts, it, it isn't a question of, am I working my... <clears throat> Am I working my request list in any specific order? I'm not. I'm going off availability of research material and 
some prioritization based off how many times it's being asked by certain people in the comments and things like that. If I see a particular aircraft coming up on multiple, multiple times, that's obviously going to be in my mind a bit more. Um, a lot of it though comes down to research material, what I have on hand, what I have distance and logistics. A again, it's, I'm going to come back to this question in a later part of this video. Well, not, not specifically, but go into a bit more detail because there are some things going on at the moment that are dictating my ability to do videos on certain aircraft that I want to cover and that I know a lot of people want me to cover. Um, but there are some limitations that are holding me back from doing certain videos and I don't want to kind of half ass anything. So certain <clears throat> potentially highly requested and sometimes some aircraft that are just, just straight up obscure that people don't know about might not appear for a good while, but there is a good reason for this. Um, I'm the storm 29 asks, and I'll, I'll read this full question. I sometimes paraphrase them, but this one's worth um, reading. Operation Paperclip's influence on Cold War aerospace is well documented. It is. Um, I've never read or heard much about what happened to the innovators in Japanese aerospace post-World War II. Was the xenophobia so strong from the West and the Soviet aerospace industries to prevent their talent from being incorporated into the new Cold War arms race? A few things factor into this, and it is a question that does get raised here and there. I've, I asked this question myself years ago when I was um, reading a book. It, it touched on Operation Paperclip, but it was, it was mostly on the development of the ME-262, and it got me thinking about the, the Japanese um, aerospace industry and everything post-World War II. So Operation Paperclip was prioritized for a couple of reasons one the us and the yeah the us basically were racing against the soviets to get to german tech whereas with japan the us felt that the russians beating them to a capitulation first was highly unlikely um mostly because they had the atom bomb and the russians didn't know that yet so the us were fairly capable of getting a capitulation out of japan um, using with that, but also even if the planned invasion of Japan had gone ahead with the US invading, um, obviously that would have been a US invasion. It, if, you know, Russia would be going down through Korea first, so it would just be a case of the Americans would be getting to Tokyo first, regardless, or Kyoto, Tokyo, wherever they kept most of their aerospace stuff. I know there was some stuff down at uh, Hero as well. Um, unfortunately, because Hiroshima, um, but, uh, well, that was one major facet in, in this point was the fact that the, um, there was more of a race to get to the Germans. Cause obviously it was, everyone was already on the same continent and, um, the, the, the Soviets had a pretty good head start in the, in, in that race to Berlin. Now on the other side of things, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I will admit that one of my weak points when it comes to aviation knowledge is Japanese aviation. Like I, I know um, a lot about the major stuff like, you know, your, your zeros and all of that, but it's, it's just not one until maybe the past two or three years that I've really started collecting, adding into my book collection on. And obviously um, I have more books than I can read in a day. So it's taking me a while to actually consume and digest the information from those books. But from what I know so far, with with a few exceptions, Japanese aviation tech was basically at parity with what was being developed in the US or the US were already ahead. Whereas in in Europe with Germany, with stuff like the Messerschmitt 262 and other projects they were working on, that was still very um, forward thinking, cutting edge. I mean, obviously in America, they were developing their own jet technology as well, but that wasn't happening as much in Japan. It was still happening to an extent, but not as much. And so there wasn't as much of a technological difference to justify a operation paperclip of the Japanese aerospace industry. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is the take that I've known for quite a while anyway. Now, of course, there was a kind of pseudo operation paperclip in Japan, and that revolved around the US main, the US's interest in unit 731, which was basically a biological weapons unit. And it's, 
it's a topic I don't like talking. I've read into it and I, I literally had nightmares after reading it for a little bit because yeah, nah, nasty stuff. Um, even the Wikipedia article is is a sobering thing on 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 Unit Seven Three One, uh, so let's just leave leave it at that. But basically, the the reason why there wasn't a Japanese aerospace operation paperclip was one, they weren't really racing against time, and two, there wasn't as much tech of value over there compared to what was coming out of Germany. And of course, I almost forgot rocket development, liquid liquid rockets, V twos, von Braun. That was a that was a huge influencer as well. Um, so it wasn't just jet technology, it was rockets and missiles and things like that. But yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Um, Graham William Kidd asks, did a Mirage 3 ever in reality ever shoot itself down by catching up to its own rounds? Now, I don't know if this was a typing error or if, if, it, it, or if it was getting confused with another topic and I've misinterpreted this question, but as far as I'm aware, a Mirage 3 never shot itself down with bullets or shells. A Grumman F11 did um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a dive test. Um, I forget the pilot's name, but basically fired off a squeeze of the rounds, squeezed off the rounds, went into a dive, and it just happened to catch up with the rounds that were coming down and it essentially crippled the uh, the F the F eleven. Um, I I might do a video on that, but honestly, it's been done to death, and it's such a it's such a clickbaity topic. It's like, oh, you know, the plane that shot itself down, blah blah blah. It's like I I uh, I I try to not make my videos too clickbaity because I try to make them semi serious. But obviously, a catchy title and thumbnail obviously gets the views, which means it gets to a wider audience. And so I'm I'm really trying to strike a balance. And I think if I covered that particular incident involving the F-11, it will, it, I, will, I will just be led into temptation to do something far too silly with it. You know, the, the, I don't want any more red arrows and circles and stuff on my thumbnails. That's already been done to death. Um, but yeah, as far as I'm aware, a Mirage um, never shot itself down, although I might be wrong. Um, but I, 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 did a, I did a quick check through. Um, I've got a book. I should have got them out honestly, but it's it's back there in one of the wardrobes. I've got a book on the on the uh, Mirage threes. Um, I forget the author's name, but it's about that thick. It's very interesting. It's got some wonderful uh, drawings and illustrations. And I had a quick look, um, and there were some incidences about notable notable um, uh, accidents and stuff involving Mirages, but I couldn't find any reference to a sh uh, it like shooting itself down either with guns or ordnance, you know, in like a low pass or something like that. And uh, having a quick look online, I couldn't see anything, but I, I might be wrong. Um, so let me know uh, in case I did misinterpret that. Um, so Jack Kiwi Bricks asks, have you considered doing videos on early operational or prototype helicopters, such as the FA-223 or Sikorsky R4 Hoverfly? Yes. This goes back to what I said on the Japanese aviation industry until fairly recently, I'd say two, three, maybe four years ago. I just didn't have a huge interest in helicopters as much as I did in aircraft. That has changed dramatically, by the way, since then. Um, I, I'm ashamed to say the thing that really converted me was... Um, the past couple of years with the emergence of virtual reality headsets and i've been able to fly helicopters in various flight simulators and it's made me realize how much fun it is to zoom at treetop level in essentially something that's just got a little bubble canopy and so that kind of got me hooked on the whole okay ready craft are actually really cool not that i didn't think they weren't cool before but ever since i was a kid i've always been a fixed wing person as opposed to a rotary rotorcraft um so yeah there are definitely plans to cover those in the future um it's a question of how many I'm going to cover and when, um, and also whether or not I do it in chronological order, because at the moment the channel really isn't following any kind of order, and I do that on purpose, because if I were to do everything in the interwar first, then everything World War II, then everything Cold War, I wouldn't get anything to anything in the Cold War until I was probably in my 50s, if not longer, and um, yeah, I'm kind of having to cherry pick the topics that I cover because I can only upload so many videos in a year and I I'll, I'll, I'll add a little clip here of how big the list is just for fixed wing aircraft topics that I want to cover at the moment but I think I'm at 
600 and something items for aircraft specifically, as in like a video covering X aircraft. I've then got a spreadsheet that's got about three or 400 video ideas for topical things where I'm not specifically doing an aircraft review overview. It could be something, say something big like the Battle of Britain, or it could be a development video like how I've been doing my early aircraft, like early Gloucester aircraft, early uh, Blackburn aircraft, like things like that. So I've got a list for topical ones as well. And then I've also got a list for um, what I call entertainment specials, which is basically what my top 10 ugliest aircraft videos are. I'm planning to do a few more of those in the future because I have a lot of fun editing those sort of videos. And because they're a bit more comedic, they're a bit more, it's a bit more levity. It's just a nice break from what is often very dry research work that I have to do for these videos. So you're hopefully going to see some more of those. Um, but that was a huge segue. I apologize from the helicopters. Um, but yeah, eventually there will be helicopters. It's probably not going to be until later on this year or next year for reasons that I'm going to be getting into shortly. Um, now there is a, an, another question that Kiwi Bricks asked, and I am going to answer it as well. I usually only do one, but the question list, uh, for this video was fairly short because these were the Patreon questions that I took from two months ago. Um, again, I'm really sorry that this has taken so long, but so much has been going on in the background that it, it just, it's weird. I can somehow find time to do aircraft overview videos, but I cannot find the time nor the courage to sit down in front of a web camera and just talk like a normal human being rather than, you know, squinting over a scripting going ah yes there are 48 spelling errors in this today yes yeah, so you know that's that's my day job um but yeah um so the final question and i think this is like only question six which has been embarrassing for me I, I really need to step on my questioning game have you considered designing and selling merch it would be a great way to support the channel via more physical means i have considered it the only reason why I haven't done it yet is I, I, if I'm going to do anything that is vaguely shop, rela shop related, merch related, I want it to be something that's honestly really worth the money. You know, I mean, a mug, a, a mug of some sort is, yeah, fair enough, but I actually want something that makes somebody go, huh, I'd actually really buy that, you know, something possibly useful. Um, so at the moment, no, no, no merch shop at the moment. I mean, people are already supporting me on the Patreon, which is amazing as it is. Um, I think we've got over, a, I, I think we're at around 110 Patreon supporters, which is brilliant. Um, I, I never expected to get particularly, um, far with Patreon just cause I don't, I'm it's, it's one of the sort of rules of YouTube is you should do more call to actions and things like that. He's like, you know, oh, please, you know, uh, if, if you want to see more of this, support the channel and subscribe or click on the Patreon or whatever. But I, I just don't like doing that. Um, mostly because A, I'm uh, uh, camera shy and also B, I just like what I do to be the thing that earns the support. Like if, if, if my videos are worthy of people going over to Patreon and giving me their money, I want the video to do that for me. I don't want to have to ask um, unless I wake up tomorrow and someone has stolen all of my money and has hacked my account. Then there might be a, a panicked cry for help. But until such a time as that disaster would ever happen, touch wood, it never does. Um, that won't happen. But at the moment, I have considered the idea of some sort of merch, um, but I haven't settled on anything I like. Not yet anyway, but if anyone has any suggestions, um, by all means, drop them below. Um, so that concludes the Q&A section of, of Rex Rambling. Um, I, I, I might split this and do a Q&A video and a Rex's Rambles video. I'm still trying to figure out what I want these videos to really be. I, I want them to be not only just me answering questions from the Patreon supporters, but also me just talking to viewers and supporters of my ch channel. Even if you're not supporting me with money, you're watching my videos and which is, you know, how I earn most of my money anyway. And of course you're liking and commenting and giving all this wonderful feedback. And part of this video is series is just me talking and, you know, giving you guys an update on what, it's been happening on my end of things, you know, behind the scenes stuff, other things. I just want to build a bit more of a 
community with the channel basically and um not just seem like a robot that apparently spends every waking breathing moment pouring over um it's rather embarrassing i don't have any books on hand but if you give me on a memento i swear i don't just um live in these every day i do have a life as well but um i i will admit that i would say probably three quarters of my time is spent reading books but thankfully i like reading um I can never often finish novels and stuff, but I can pour through a textbook like it's uh, like it's a gripping thriller for some reason. Now, there are some novels that I can read. I, I'm, I'm quite a fan of uh, certain things, but my goodness, I'm digressing today. So um, <clears throat> sorry about that. I just had to go and um, refill my glass because I was getting a little bit dehydrated. Um, so, yes, doing these videos, Q&A, but also general channel updates, building community etc cetera, etc cetera. so what's been going on um first of all well i've actually given myself a list of topics of discussion um so that i don't have massive um tangents into things that aren't relevant to what i want to talk about so the first thing i want to talk about is i am slowing you probably already noticed um i've slowed down the video schedule so it used to be well way back when i was really churning it out about a year ago it was a video every three days so be an upload two days, and then another upload, two days, another upload, two days. And then it went to an upload on a Saturday and then an upload on a Wednesday. Sometimes one of them would be like a day late, depending if I have editing issues. Now at the moment, it's an upload every Saturday with a maybe on a Wednesday. And this is for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm slowing it down because one, at the moment, I am just quite burned out. <laughs> this, this, it is a full it is a full-time job doing what, what this is and you know i i know some people are like oh you know you're just reading books and things like that and you know surely you must just it's just the same as you know doing an essay for school or something by just copying points from wikipedia and talking about it in a slightly different manner and it's 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 not that at all it's i i my research process is basically half the time if it's a physical book um just because the way that my brain works, um, I, I'm atrocious with note taking of physical books. So I've got a big ass scanner here next to me. And so for the aircraft that I want to cover, I'll get the books that I need and I'll have to scan those things page by page. And sometimes it'll be just a day or two of just book scanning before I've even gotten to the next stage of doing a video. So I scan the book and then I'll open it up with my, um, I actually usually, and this might be heretical for some people, I open the PDFs in Microsoft Edge because I find I find Microsoft Edge is actually more user friendly for reading through massive PDFs than using Acrobat Reader. I find Acrobat Reader crashes more than Microsoft Edge does, and Microsoft Edge has a more user friendly highlighting feature, and I just prefer it. So usually I've scanned my books, or if I'm lucky, I've already got a scanned PDF given to me by a friend or someone I know in the industry, um, and I go through and I highlight all my points. I then basically copy all of those points into a, a document and I arrange the, those points in the order in which I want to talk about because often books some books are written in chronological order but sometimes they're written in chronological and topical order and that'll dictate how easy it is to build a script off them because obviously I, I'm, I try to do my videos in a very specific way which I'm sure a lot of people have noticed by now so the next thing is organizing all those bullet points and then I open up a second um, uh, document and that document I then cross-reference what I know with, I basically scan two or three major sources, I use those as my basis, but then I cross-reference them with at least a couple of others if I can find them, I check for errors and things like that. Usually I find one or two. Um, and then after that, I make the script. And usually by this point, I've read through the material three or four times. And what I do is I essentially go in blind and I write a script based off what I've memorized as much as I can. And then I go through and I fill in the blanks by referring back to the material, obviously going through all the nitty gritty stuff. And by the end of it, there is a script, which usually hopefully feels really organic because I, I try to do my videos in a way that it's more kind of like a, a podcast or if I'm in a room and just trying to explain something, because if you try and read, um, uh, say for the Dornier 17 video, I just did, for example, if you try and read, say a paragraph about the development of the Dornier 17 verbatim from a book, 
it's really difficult to speak because these books are designed to be read and not spoken. And so the grammar and the pacing of, of the book is very different than how you would do it if you were presenting this in a narrative format. And um, when I was first doing this channel, that was such a challenge for me. And that is why all of my earlier videos were so short. I just couldn't manage doing that workload efficiently and correctly for longer videos. And as time has gone on, my videos have gotten longer, which is the other reason why I'm having to slow down the upload rate. A, a one hour video is considerably more work than a 12 minute video. And if I'm trying to do that kind of thing on a twice a week upload schedule, I would literally have no life. Um, you know, and I think you guys won't be able to see this on the screen because I'm recording on Zoom, but looking at my channel, um, my videos now are definitely trending towards the longer length, like the most recent videos, hour 15 for the Dornia, 31 minutes for the F2F, F3F, 17 minutes for the Pete said Dell 24. Then there's a couple of shorter ones, a 12 minute one for the Bolton for Paul, a 14 minute one for the Loire 130. And then we're back up to another long one, which is 45 for the Hampton, nearly 20 minutes for the um, Hayford, nearly half an hour for the CR32. Then there was the interview one with Drakini fell, but we did that obviously on the cusps. So that was different. But like, you see what I mean? Like on average, most of my videos are now over 15 minutes. Most are over 20 minutes now, as opposed to a year ago where those longer format videos were definitely in the major minority. So that's having a huge influence on my workload, obviously. But yeah, so slowing down the... The videos is from a burnout perspective and also from a sanity perspective because my videos are getting longer, but the burnout has come because I wasn't slowing down quickly enough and I was trying to bang out all of these really good quality videos and it was, it was getting to the point where I was essentially at my desk with breaks, obviously, but at my desk for 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week when I wasn't away from home and um, that has taken its toll. <laughs> um, sitting down for long periods of time isn't good for your health, as my doctor has told me. So I'm, I'm having to kind of be up and a bit more active in stuff. Very lucky where I live at the moment, it's really hilly. So I can um, go for like jogs and walks and it's a proper workout. It isn't just flat, like it's really hilly here. Um, which on humid summer days here in Australia, it's, it's actually a bit much sometimes, but I need the exercise. The, the other reason why I'm slowing down the videos is because I wanted to free up some time to do planning. I want to figure out a bit more of what I want to do long term now that I have the freedom to do so. I mean, obviously, I'm going to be doing these videos for a long time, but at the same time, I, I want to add a few other different things onto the channel. Obviously, still videos because this is YouTube, but I, I, I want to do a couple of slightly different things on the channel to keep things mixed and add some variety both for my own sanity and obviously so that people don't get burned out as watching aviation overviews all the time because you know there, there is such a thing as getting burned out on the content you like to watch you know um they call it viewer fatigue apparently in the movie industry so i i, I can appreciate that so i'm i'm planning on um adding some slightly different uh, video topics onto the channel moving forward obviously nothing uh, too outlandish, obviously still aviation related, but it's just a little bit different to what I'm doing now. And that's, um, uh, I keep everything. I have like a little journal here that I do all of my planning and stuff in. So that's where, this is where the magic happens. This is where I kind of plan out my month and go, okay, obviously like this is done a few months in advance. So I've already planned out what videos I want to do between now and roughly July, but all the magic happens in these journals. I, I don't like doing it on the computer. I, I like to sit somewhere else, and let the creative juices flow. Usually after I've had about my body waiting coffee. Um, now, speaking of long-term plans, there are other related plans that won't be coming in the form of video. Um, I'm actually working, well, not working on yet, but I'm in the planning stages of some books, um, aviation books, like not like novels or anything, although I would love to be a published uh, novel writer one day, but I can never get them finished. Uh, but these other projects seem to be in a real good chance of actually getting finished. Now, one, I don't really want to go into too much details on what these are, because spoilers, but one is going to be a, a book 
on what I do best, which is look into kind of the weird and obscure aircraft. Um, I'm currently talking with some people in in the historian industry. Is that is that is that a term for it? But I, I'm talking with some of my peers, basically, um, figuring out ideas, uh, getting contacts at various archives for me to try and source blueprints and information. I'm not going to go into any more details because I I, I want to do a more formal announcement later on there's probably going to be a kickstarter for it because obviously publishing a book is expensive especially if it's going to be something that's going to have a lot of printed illustrations obviously going to have to be in color obviously going to have fairly good quality print ink paper etc so um i haven't gotten to the number crunching yet but it's it's going to be a fairly ambitious project so i but i just wanted to mention that now because that's something else i have planned for the future but all of these planning or all, all of these plans take time and to get time i need to slow down a little bit on the video uploads so that i can actually sit down with a clear head that isn't worried about editing scripting researching algorithm youtube views etc so there's there's that uh now now we'll come to the main topic that i really want to talk about because this is this is what is influencing everything at the moment it's influencing what videos i can do it's influencing um my plans immediate and long term um trying to buy a house trying to buy a house my partner and i um and and that is requiring some sacrifices because uh funnily enough banks and credit unions don't view youtube is a particularly stable income funnily enough I, I i don't i can't blame them but basically getting a mortgage is very difficult it is possible but it's very difficult um and it's basically required me to essentially cut all spending i did have plans to say go to oshkosh this year and go to oshkosh next year that's been blown out of the water i can't do that now because i just basically need to have as little outgoing as possible in my bank statements so that it looks good for the banks this is influencing what videos i want to do because i had plans to go to museums specifically in europe and in the states where i could do in-person segments for videos about particularly big and famous aircraft like things like the supermarine spitfire b-17 flying fortress you know all the big things from world war ii and a lot of cold war stuff as well things that um operated in korea like the mig-15 for example and stuff from in in the mid cold war as well mig-21s etc i had plans to start covering a lot of those this year moving into next year those plans have all been pushed back until we basically have a mortgage um we don't know when that's going to be yet um currently in the process of um working with a broker to hopefully get something sorted out um, so yeah, that's obviously had a huge impact on uh, my plans. Um, the the only overseas trip that I'm still doing this year is one to the UK, um, which I'm going to be doing some channel related stuff, but that's mostly to see family because I've not been back to my home country since 2016. So I'm wanting to see relatives and everything over there and see friends as well. Um, th thankfully, that was pretty much already paid for about a year ago so i didn't need to cut costs on that because i had already paid for it so um i am i am going to be uh doing some stuff in the uk so i'm hope i'm hoping to do some sort of impromptu live streams at some places it all depends on what's going on and what's happening when but i will be doing a follow-up video in about six weeks time eight weeks time maybe where I go over the what the plan is as well because I'm going to assign some specific days where I'm probably going to be going live doing certain things but I haven't figured out what those days are yet uh but yeah so trying trying to buy a house uh is having uh, adverse effects and um houses are expensive um thankfully where where we're going to be buying is 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 when we're not going to be buying in a major city like Brisbane or Sydney because uh I don't have a million dollars for a house um and also um i don't really want to live in a big busy city i'm i i'm my partner and i we, we both prefer quieter country living like not completely in the sticks or anything like that but we just we, we want to be able to drive for 10 minutes and be outside of town not in just another built-up suburb um and and thankfully 
despite the stereotyping of Australia having really bad internet, I mean, it does, but thankfully most of the um, places we've been, we've been looking at in the city that we're looking at, um, well, rural town really have fairly good internet. So it's not, it's not going to hopefully have an impact on what I do. And, you know, good internet is basically one of the, um, mandatory requirements that are being outlined with real estate agents. So hopefully that'll never be a problem, but, but yes, the house hunting things affecting things. The house situation is affecting things in other ways because I have run out of space, which is why I'm in a Zoom call because you do not want to see what is behind me because it's 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 disturbing. Um, it's a mess is what it is. I, I live in a room like I'm in a I'm in a unit like I have hundreds, thousands of books. <laughs> do the math um obviously not a rule in here you know i've got a storage unit and stuff but it, it's it's gotten to the point where i'm just i'm just out of space which means i can't really buy any more research material if i need it um i have stuff stacked on my desk here i have stuff stacked on my desk there i my bed is behind me but my bed isn't a bed during the day my bed is a shelf during the day so there's stacks of books on it during the day which i then have to move at night so i can actually go to sleep um thankfully i've um for years now i've always lived in fairly small places so it doesn't feel claustrophobic for me so this is very natural for me i don't mind being in a shoebox but it obviously has impacts on what i can do and what i would love to do is these live streams um doing these sometimes as live streams in like a nice room with bookshelves behind me so i can actually look somewhat like someone who might be pretending to be an aviation historian and not have to worry about like this crappy fake green screen effect that I'm having to deal with at the moment. Um, so that's, that's something else, um, which is why a lot of the, that, that's the other reason why I'm not doing a lot of these Q and A's at the moment is just, they are such a hassle because I have to move so much stuff to be able to clear space. And then it all looks crap anyway. So I end up sticking a green screen. So trying to make the room look presentable was a waste of time anyway. So hopefully once, um, once we're settled in a house, um, things will be able to pick up pace on this front, um, which leads me into my next topic, which is live streaming. I really want to do some live streaming stuff in the future, probably on like a Sunday, like on a weekend where most people have the time to actually hop on and say hi. Um, not only where I answer questions, but just, just to hang out with people that in, enjoy the things I enjoy. So there might be streams where we, you know, look at particular aviation topics it might be streams i'm just chilling like doing flight simulator or kerbal space cram kerbal kerbal space program you can tell i've been up since 5 a.m it's uh it's, it's it's becoming very obvious now but live streaming is something i want to do but i can't do it yet because i don't want to do it in this environment because it's it's okay to record stuff in but i again i want a i want a more comfortable environment so that i feel more comfortable being live and talking to people, you know, for one, two, three, four hours, etc. So that's another thing that's planned for the future. Hopefully that future will be within the next six months. Again, it really all depends on um, how quickly we can, we can get a house. Um, I'm really looking forward to having a house. I mean, obviously, you know, cause it'll be hours, but, um, you know, some people are probably aware, but my, my partner and I, we don't live together at the moment. We've been doing the whole long distance thing since the start of COVID for financial and job related reasons. And um, that's the reason why you'll often see posts of me going, hey, I'm away for a couple of weeks. And that's because I'm off visiting my beloved who I haven't seen for months on end and our dog because Max lives with her, not with me, because where I live at the moment isn't very well suited for a big bunk rambunctious german shepherd and you know he's he's five years old now but he's still a giant puppy and um where my partner's living they, they they have a lot more space so uh it's 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 more friendly for a dog so you know we're all looking forward to living together again and uh just having a slightly more normal life after the the insanity that was 2020 and 2021 like i yeah that, that those were a strange couple of years but um it's I think that's the other thing that's that's had an impact on the video uploads recently is I just need to get into a space where it's just easier to do it all because at the moment it's manageable like I'm able to get the videos up and everything like that but sometimes I have to pause production because I've realized oh crap I need a book that is 
X somewhere. Right? It isn't readily available, basically. And when we've got a bigger place, that isn't going to be an issue because if I need to get a book, I'll just go to one of the six billion bookshelves that we've installed because um, she's a teacher. I do aviation history. We're going to have a library. Like This isn't even a, a up for debate. We've already agreed we're having a library. So that's, that's not going to be an issue uh, from a research standpoint. But at the moment, it is. I just have no space. So that was a very long winded way of me explaining that I have no space. And reason number 53, why this is called a Rex rambles video, because I am literally just rambling because I'm not doing this on a script. I'm just talking as honestly as I can and probably making a dog's dinner of it. Uh, now going back to my list so that I don't go too far off topic. So I talked about doing live streaming, um, and another reason why I haven't done live streaming yet is if I was going to do some flight sim stuff, I was thinking about doing it in virtual reality, but then I realized how problematically, how much of a problem that would be because A, the screen will be shaking a lot because the VR headset picks up every movement. And B, I wouldn't be able to see um, the live stream chat in VR unless I install a special third party app that displays it and then that tanks my performance anyway. So it's kind of a kind of a lose lose. Um, now, what other things did I want to talk about? Ah, yes. So, other platforms. I am thinking of... Conv oh, actually, well, I'm not thinking. I'm going to. Uh, this is by popular request. Going to be converting um, quite a few of the videos and a lot of them moving forward into podcast things um, so that people can just listen to them. Because most of my videos, you can just listen to. And that was by design. I wanted my videos to be done in such a way that you could just be listening to them whilst you're doing other things and learning about the aircraft. And what you would see on the screen is more of an added bonus. Like if you're not watching the screen, you're not missing out on anything too hugely important. And I'm, I'm trying to maintain that as much as possible, even with adding in the, the new fancy 3D stuff. So I'm getting some podcast platformy stuff set up and i'm also thinking about doing some smaller uploads that are like podcast exclusive maybe i haven't i haven't thought that through yet but i i am going to be doing some interviews with some individuals um those at, at museums but also people um that are that are veterans from various air forces um i i haven't got any thing lined up in the short term but i've been speaking with people i'm making medium to long-term plans Again, the house situation is delaying everything, but hopefully this is something that I can start getting properly underway in the second half of this year, probably in the spring, well, the autumn for most of you, in, mostly in the Southern Hemisphere, but for me, it'd be spring down here. So probably around September, October is when we'll start seeing uh, some updates on the podcast front. I might be uploading some stuff on there for the time being, like just some reruns of what I've already done so that people can just listen whilst they're driving and things like that but for the time being this is more of an advice thing i'm advising you that i'm working on a podcast but nothing's really happening yet but it, it is um it's on my to-do list that i'm looking at right here so that's something that's happening in the future and uh, aside from that there's only one other thing to talk about and that is um what have I been up to? Because some some people on on Discord and on YouTube have very very kindly asked, you know, hey 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 Rex, you've you've been really busy, you know, do you, do you have any hobbies other than <laughs> than doing this on a on a almost daily basis? It seems, and it's like, yeah, I have I have um recently been putting in an effort to try and build some semblance of a work life balance because um doing doing what I do and doing this on YouTube it's it's very easy to get sucked into the grind set mentality as we say in the online space it, it's very easy to get easily hooked on looking at your analytics data every single day you know just hyper fixating on what went well what didn't go well with a particular video and that snowballs into doing more work and to thinking oh is this video even going to be worth doing and i'm obviously doing a lot of research so i'm always agonizing over that and it you know as i mentioned earlier i was pulling 10 12 hour days so i've been scaling that back and getting back into some hobbies and doing some things and uh, rather stereotypically you'll find one of the things i recently been getting into again 
is uh, aircraft modeling, which is something I haven't done for years and years and years. And um, one that I'm currently working on, although I unfortunately dropped it. So I've got to repaint sections of it. Uh, you probably won't see it very well because of the screen, but it's a it's a, it's a MiG-27 uh, that I've been working on. Um, it's the, the paint, the paint's gone on all right, but I've had uh, some issues with it. The colors aren't exact because the, the model shops where I live didn't have the exact uh, paints for the scheme that I wanted to use. So I had to mix my own paint colors for it. And I made a cock of the light green, unfortunately. It shouldn't have, it should have been more of a yellowy green to complement the brown, but it just came out as more like a melon green. So this is a, it's a, it's a fruity MiG-27 flogger. It's a fruity flogger. And um, there's obviously the, um, the, the vampire where I got the, the kiwi uh, roundels on backwards, which was a big boo-boo. And there's about 10, I, I've already fallen into the hole of airfix modeling again. There's like 10 other unassembled ones in my closet back there, which I eventually need to do. And I've already got a drawer full of paint. So it's already turned into a money pit and I've only built like three models so far. So that's one thing. Um, un, un, people, people will be very surprised uh, that I enjoy playing video games. Not really surprised at all, but I, I've been a gamer since I was about four. Um, you know, first ever gaming console when I was a kid was, I think it was like a PlayStation 1 or an N64 or something. And I've been on them ever since, you know, it's just one of my favorite hobbies. So, but nowadays it's, I don't get to game that much, but on, on the weekends, if I get a chance, I uh, game with some mates and things like that. But unfortunately right now we've been having some internet issues, which hasn't helped, but, um, Mostly it's flight sims, which again, probably will surprise nobody. Um, DCS, IL2, flight simulator, etc. Um, the other thing I've been trying to get into and sort of succeeding question mark is, um, is art, but, uh, I'm far too, far too bashful to show any of that, but, um, uh, two kind of, uh, two styles of art, well, one, well, you could call them both art because it's the arts, but um, I, I'm I'm big into music. Um, I had a crack at composing pieces using FL Studio for a while, and I also just like doing um, digital painting and things like that. So that that's been something I've been working on in the background as well. Also, that's going to be used on the channel to try and uh, make some cool looking thumbnails. But until uh, my skills are at a level that I feel confident actually showing that, I'm going to be commissioning some artists instead. So there should hopefully be some exclusive channel art coming in the near future, both for the actual channel itself and um, for some special videos coming up. There's going to be some thumbnails that aren't made by yours truly, but they're made by some people that are um, well known in certain areas for doing some amazing aviation art so that is uh, something to look forward to in the future now if i've been moving a lot in my chair it's because i've had far too much coffee today so i apologize if i've been sitting in here like an adhd powered mouse but that's how i feel today um that is all the major topics i think i need to talk about and uh, this has probably gone for way too long anyway because again this is just me rambling on and i don't actually know how to properly organize these videos yet. But if anyone has any further questions, any follow-ups, please drop them in a comment below and I will do my best to answer them. But um, before you all leave, the final thing I should have talked about in the beginning was uh, by the time this goes up, I'm probably not going to be here. I'm away, funnily enough, seeing my partner. So I'll be back in about two weeks in the middle of April. So there should hopefully be videos going up in the time being, at least one maybe two um and then things should resume again afterwards but i may not be able to reply to too many comments depending on what the internet situation is like where we are and driving about and blah 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 and i also just like to switch off when i get away from the office you know turn off the youtube app and just be on holiday what a what a strange concept to actually um step away from work for a couple of days <laughs> but um i hope you guys enjoyed this very long rambling video um Hopefully if the reception is good, I'll keep these going. If, if, if you guys prefer something a bit more organized and a bit more scripted, I can do that as well. But I just wanted to do something a bit more honest. So um, yeah, drop your comments below and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.